I know a great deal about you. I know your story, your suffering. I know the magnitude of your financial burden. And I also know that your daughter is dying, Mr. Whitaker. The treatment they're proposing is hardly more than a placebo, I'm afraid. Dr. Moore hasn't delivered the news yet, but your daughter's disease has progressed, and it pains me to inform you that she is terminal. The fear that had saturated Charles slowly began fermenting into a vile, bitter anger as he listened to these heart-rending words being spoken by this silken voice. Who the fuck are you to speak to me like this? You've intruded in my home in the dead of the night for what? To twist the knife? To kick me when I'm down? For laughs? Is this a fucking game to you? He spit these venomous words across the bed with vitriol. You misunderstand me. I'm offering you reprieve, solace. I'm offering you a way out of this hole in which you find yourself, Mr. Whitaker. This is my proposal. I possess the power to lift the disease from your child. I can do this and more. Wouldn't you like to wake in the morning to your daughter's laughter, to your wife sleeping soundly by your side, to your pristine Camaro in the driveway and financial wealth in your bank? The raging inferno that has been building inside of Charles went cold. A faint and distant ringing filled his ears, and for a moment it was all too much as unconsciousness threatened to overtake him. I don't understand. How could you possibly have that power? How could anything? Why tempt me with hollow promises? I have no reason to trust you. Charles uttered these words, but they lacked conviction. He stared off into the darkness while contemplating that the possibility. There are many things with great power, Mr. Whitaker. You can trust me. After all, this isn't the first time we've met. I upheld my end of the arrangement then, and I will do so now. What do you mean we've met? I've never seen you before in my life, and I'd recall something as striking as, as this. I'm not surprised you don't remember. It was a long time ago for you, when you were but a child yourself. I gave you your first taste of money, and you've been slavering for it ever since. Our arrangement was the same arrangement that I have with every child, even little Helen sleeping in the next room. I purchase your teeth with my coin. When you're dealing with children, it's best to keep your arrangements simple. But you are no longer a child, Mr. Whitaker, and our arrangement will not be so simple, although my payment remains unchanged. An arm snaked out of the murky darkness, revealing a hand bathed in moonlight, a hand of pale flesh with far too many long and slender fingers tipped with jagged and black nails. The palm turned downward as it rolled a silver piece across its many knuckles. Dawning horror spread across Charles's face in the darkness of his bedchamber as he fully realized the gravity of the situation and the extent of the proposal. Up until this moment, I had convinced myself that I was still asleep, caught somewhere between a dream and nightmare. Am I to understand that you're claiming to be the tooth fairy? Charles stared into the void of darkness as he attempted to fathom this new concept, the possibility that everything he knew was not real, but could suddenly be very real. I am claiming to be what I am. I have very little care for what nomenclatures your people have attached to me. I have existed for far longer than you could wrap your mind around. This piece of silver in my hand is one of the 30 pieces of silver paid to Judas in exchange for betraying Christ. In the time that I've walked the earth, there have been countless names associated with me, and not a single one of them matter in the slightest. I am, and you are, and Helen is. That is all that matters. And the agreement you're proposing, I'll get everything back. My daughter's health, my wife, everything? Upon completion of your end of the agreement, yes. Just to be clear, you, you want to take my teeth? The blood pulsing through Charles's body created a dull roar in his ears, and as he uttered the words, they sounded muted and distant. As I said before, Mr. Whitaker, I'm not interested in what there is to take, but rather what you're willing to give. I want you to want to give me your teeth. There was a shift in the darkness near the foot of the bed as something emerged from the shadows and landed heavily on the duvet next to Charles. He looked down, allowing his eyes to focus in the darkness and saw what he already knew in his heart was there, a pair of old rusty pliers. 
Charles slowly released the death grip he had on the blanket, feeling the painful throb explode in the swollen joints of his fingers. With a trembling hand, he slowly reached over and grasped the pliers. Do you accept the terms of our agreement? I do. Charles slowly raised the pliers to his open jaws, saliva already spilling from the corner of his mouth. He opened the pliers with a faint squeak of metal and clamped them around his upper left incisor, feeling the metal scrape against the barren animal and slicing into the gum line. He let out an involuntary moan as he began pulling. The pressure in his upper jaw was immense as he felt the bone of his mandible fracture around the root of his tooth. Charles coughed as he gagged with nausea and a spray of blood and saliva speckled the off-white of the duvet in front of him. The tooth proved to be more difficult to extract than Charles expected, and amidst his panic, he wrenched the pliers forward and backward. That did the trick as the tooth ripped through the gums and came free with a jerk, his hands shaking violently. He dropped the gore-smeared tooth onto the mattress and willed himself not to vomit as the crimson flooded over his chin, falling in heavy droplets to be hungrily absorbed by the duvet. One down. 31 to go.